Booze and Barbecue. How's it going, you guys? Good. Going well. We've got a friend of the show, friend of the podcast, and friend to us, Chris the Wine Guy here. Chris, how are you doing? You know, I'm excited to be here today. Thank you so much for having me and uh, really excited to, uh, to to drink some wine with y'all. It's been way too long. Very much so. Cannot wait to try them. We went ahead and had a little bit of lunch so that we could, you know, drink as much wine as we needed to and, and not feel uh, too out of sorts. I went ahead and smoked up a rabbit today mm-hmm. and a little green beans and rice on the side. It, it felt very Southern except for the Herbe de Provence. Southern French. Southern. Ooh, oh, there you Southern go. Southern French. Yeehaw. I like that. <laughs> That's awesome. So with lunch, you picked a wine for us. I Tell did. Tell us about that. So this is the the other red grape of Burgundy. So um, here in the Willamette Valley, we, we, we drink a lot of Pinot Noir, as as well as y'all should as well. Pinot Noir tracking back to its its homeland in Burgundy, France. The And of course, Pinot Noir is French for black peanut <laughs> yes yes the 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 darkest of the peanuts yeah yeah no it's not <laughs> so i uh, i believe that 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 pino traces back and i'm, I'm gonna kick myself later if i'm wrong Corian like that one. Oh my god I'm, <laughs> I'm still laughing black peanut oh man. anyway so back to france you know they they grow a lot of a uh, grow a lot of wine there. They grow a lot of wine there. <laughs> um, so so this is the 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 other red grape of Burgundy, and it's um, the other red meat. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, <laughs> pretty much. You know, um, oh gosh. Speaking of red meat, I don't know where I was or who was talking about this, but someone was talking about how pig is technically red meat. It just has less of whatever, but you can't consider it not red meat from a purely like physiological yeah. standpoint. Yeah, right. It, it has fewer nuclei and stores less ATP in the fibers of the muscles. So it is not a muscle that is used for endurance exercise, endurance activities. It's used more for spurts and sprints. Okay, so let's compare... Uh, chicken, which is mostly white meat, to a duck, which is mostly or all red meat. What do ducks do? They migrate. They fly south for the winter and Mm -hmm. then they fly north in the spring. And they have a lot of physiology built in to store energy and efficiently and over a long period of time contract and relax repetitively. Whereas chickens just run really quick and then stop and stare at you and make sure you're chasing them. So you're trying mm. to say chickens are red meat? What sh- <laughs> so what she's, what she's saying is the difference between the light and dark meat in poultry mm-hmm. is the difference between the light and the dark meat in mm. mammals. Yes. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So technically pork is red meat meat physiologically but if you compare that to beef it's the reason why you know veal is is white, white. in color because it doesn't move around they, mm-hmm. they stick it in a pen and uh just let it eat and so you end up with it of course it's still beef but it doesn't have that dark red color because it's not standing and walking and grazing its entire life yes. all right yeah rabbits exactly the same way short bursts mm-hmm. but lots of time just kind of laying and conserving energy mm-hmm hmm. Interesting. Yes, exactly. Sounds like my life. Spatchcocked and delicious. I was about to say, I'm probably a white meat. (laughs) 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 All right, we've gotten totally sidetracked. So this is the second grape that they grow in Burgundy. Yeah, the second red grape um, called Gamay. And they do grow a little bit here in the Willamette Valley as well. Um, we know of a couple of vineyards mm-hmm. that grow Gamay. I mm-hmm. love a good Gamay Noir. Mm-hmm. And there, there are some good ones up here. But you got to go got to go back to the, the homeland. And this is what we have. And as we were going into a deeper dive later in the segment um, about aged Pinot Noir and aged wines in general, I wanted to try to pull a couple of the youngest wines that I had in my in my cell to share with you all mm-hmm. so that we could we could have a little bit of uh, this and that and a little bit of a uh, progression through the years nice vertical tasting mm-hmm. I like backwards that. a backwards vertical and you know most 
Most winemakers and most uh, professional tasters prefer to taste the younger wines first. That makes sense. And progress to the older wines. Because even though the younger wines will generally have more robust flavors and generally m much uh, more aggressive structure... As you move to the older wines, you have those, uh, those, those tertiary flavors that they're, they're just so much more complex. It's actually not fair to the young wines to have them after the older wines. I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. That makes now, sense. I, I will say if you're, if you're hanging out and, you know, doing a, doing a party or something like that, you know, start, start with your best things first. And, you know, once, once you're a few in and you're, you're not really paying attention to things, open up whatever. But that's the different, uh, different story there. So now that y'all have this in your glass here, have a swig and it's similar to Pinot Noir in some ways, but, uh, very different in many others. Well, what do you think, hon? What do you smell? First thought was kind of a raisin when I smell it spice mm -hmm. so when we're getting into we're getting into some older wines uh throughout the tasting i want to talk about kind of uh general classes of some flavors so okay. you've got super generally speaking primary secondary and tertiary flavors in wine so primary flavors are things directly derived from the fruit okay um you're gonna see a lot of primary flavors with this mm -hmm. um secondary flavors are generally considered to be derived from winemaking process so barrel aging or with this generally Beaujolais is made with some some component of carbonic maceration. I, 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 to be honest, don't have the tech sheets on this wine, so I don't know. But carbonic maceration is where fermentation takes place inside the whole grape, and it, it creates a lot of uh, very fruit-driven um, flavors. Mm-hmm. Is that the breakdown of the sugars into alcohol? Mm -hmm. So um, your your primary fermentation, sugar into alcohol, secondary fermentation, your malic acid into lactic acid. Well, it is very fruit forward. There's a backbone of acid and then there's a very dry finish. I get quite a bit of tannins off of this, but interestingly, it is a really good balance because it's it's very sweet up front and then it dries your mouth out. But then after about 30 seconds, I feel like my palate's pretty clear and I'm ready for another sip. Yeah, I don't feel the tannins are super strong on this. I've definitely had some more tannin wines. This is a really nice balanced wine, but mm -hmm. the French do wine really well. I would argue that Oregon does not better. I'm really interested to try this compared to other Oregon Gamay's. So recently at work, we've been doing this, uh, this, this blind tasting competition between the different, uh, the different segments of the winery. So we've got management, we've got production staff, and we've got tasting room staff all on separate teams. And, um, I want to be on these teams. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of cutthroat. I got to say it's kind of cutthroat. I think, uh, with, with yesterday's tasting, we taste every Friday and it's completely blind. It's, uh, you know, the, the wines rebottled into, um, three, seven, five milliliter bottles that are unmarked. So you have no idea what it is. It just a bottle of wine appears on your glass in the morning or on, on your desk in the morning. And, uh, you've got till the afternoon to try to figure out. Nice. Yeah. It's, it's fun. There's some weird stuff that's come up. Uh, one of, uh, one of my coworkers went to the wine program at OSU huh? and the way that they, uh, the way that they do their winemaking program there, the winemaking program happens in the spring. There's no fresh grapes in the spring. So they freeze the grapes and then thaw them and then make wine out of them. So he brought, he brought that and it, it comes out pretty weird. That it comes out kind of fun. Weird. Wouldn't that be sweeter, concentrating the sugars down? No, because it all. Uh, so you're you're thinking of of like ice wine. Yeah. So if they were to to then press it while it was uh, while it was frozen, yeah, the water will freeze first, and it'll let the the nectar of the fruit kind of come out. But this, they're letting it thaw, okay. and then doing it. So okay. It's, Making wine with previously frozen grapes. That's interesting. That's like yeah. making pie with previously frozen berries. Definitely going to taste different. It is going to be different. Mm -hmm. Very much so. so. There is a fresh berry pie and there's a frozen berry pie. I would say frozen berry pies generally should just be like a crisp. And you put like a little brown sugar and oatmeal on top and serve it with ice cream. I'm so okay. what did you think of that wine? Did you guess correctly? Nobody guessed correctly. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll just put it there. I, uh, I did get the vintage, which, um, which, which was a, was a feat. 
but um but yeah no nobody guessed correctly and was the vintage 2018 <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> No, you got to time. You, you got to have time to freeze them. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> that's good right. Point. That's right. Yeah. Very good point. What what kind of grapes were they? Pinot Noir. Okay. Oh, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. That's Noir. impressive. That's a fun game to play. Mm-hmm. I like these I, games. I think I think I might play that game next time I come in here. I don't know. Oh, I like, ooh, that I like we, this we, game. We, we can bring it. We can bring it home to y'all. New yeah. game. Guess that wine. We could do that with whiskey too. I I like the idea of that. Yeah. Sign me up. Yeah. So a few weeks ago, I had a competition with myself with whiskey. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I was really in a mood to decide what rye whiskey under a certain price point was my favorite. So I went to my local liquor store and I picked up five, six bottles of rye and three I had had. One I had not had, but I chose. And the other... I had not had, but the cashier chose. Now, he's 12 years younger than I am, so he thought that was just the greatest thing at the time. At first, I thought you were going to say he's 12 years old. (laughs) (laughs) He's 12 years younger than I am. Well, fun fact about people work in liquor stores, they don't actually know that much about liquor. Most of them. Some some you'll you'll be surprised. surprised. That's the owner-operator. Yeah. That's not just your everyday alcoholic mind. So <laughs> I I am a very big rye whiskey fan and double rye, the bigger the rye, the more I love it. And I really like just a pure rye whiskey. I'm not as I've learned not as much of a fan of some unique blends. And I liked I think I liked the bullet rye and I liked the Knob Creek rye were my two favorites. And then you like the Pendleton rye. And Eastside Distillery had, there was a rye that mm-hmm. they had at the liquor store, but not the one that we had at a special tasting. Right. And then there was one other. Well, because if you had had the Burnside Double Rye, or excuse me, Eastside Double Rye. Eastside Double Rye. That would have probably been my favorite. But oh, they, yeah. That, they didn't have that at the liquor store. Even that one I love. That's an absolute knockout of a whiskey. The Eastside, just regular rye, it's good, mm-hmm. but it's not really really rye forward like Corian likes i really like that big floral notes with the burn on the end and i like manhattans mm-hmm. you like it to kick you in the teeth i do i wanted to grab me by the throat and shake me around a little bit i'm i'm with you i'm like with that. you i like rye for the very same reason yes i probably like the pendleton for the opposite reason it, it really didn't more, have much of a rye on it no I, it was more bourbon I, than I, it was rye i gotta tell you y'all have very sharp palates because the pendleton is not rye Ah, it says see? it's rye, but Canadian rye win. So, um, the Canadians love you all up in the Great White North. <laughs> they, Canadians. um, they they just call whiskeys rye. It's not because oh. there's predominantly rye in the in the mash, and so they just call call Canadian whiskey rye, and you can use the two terms um interchangeably. How dare Got they? It. Got it. I will never trust a Canadian again. So what Chris is saying is all Canadians are liars, but not all liars are Canadian. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. You know, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going there. No. <laughs> I, I have had some wonderful times in, in Montreal mm-hmm. and Niagara. Mm-hmm. Uh, I will tell you a Canadian lied to me in Montreal though. Oh. So, you know, track well, that's, record. That's French, French Canadian, Canadian though, so <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> Speaking of French. This wine is really good. <laughs> yeah, I like this wine a lot. Yeah. It it doesn't taste like a, a 2016. I think it. I mean, it has some young characteristics to it, but it's very good. It's very good. And and the the point of Beaujolais is that it is unabashedly, for the most part, um, just come drink me. You know, it's it's not anything that, you know, requires a lot of thought, requires a lot of effort. It just uh, it just says, hey, come come get me. Let's hang out. And uh, Corianne's cracking up and I'm loving every second of it. I want to say that's what she said <laughs> so many times. <laughs> <I love>. um, <laughs> you know, you, you can personify maybe this wine is a woman. I don't know. I would say, yes, this wine could be a woman. Very much so. And I love The Office. So there we go. I love The Office so much. Such a good show. I cried when it ended. It was terrible. Oh, crocodile tears. It was hilarious. Oh, I felt so betrayed. <laughs> oh, yeah, but did did you like some of the other managers? Because they, they had a stint there. And uh, spoiler alert, but if you haven't seen The Office yet, you know, 
to heck it with it. Shame on you. Mm-hmm. You deserve this. Yes. Exactly. I, I, I don't I don't think I like the other uh, managers as well as Steve Crow. I, I don't think they could have done it without him. No, I, I don't think they. And I'm so glad that he showed up the very last episode when Dwight got married. Mm-hmm. Ha ha. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, speaking of The Office, I, I have a huge affinity for The Office. Yes. I actually um, when I was uh, running the photography studio in California, I used to wake up every morning and I had a uh, I had a computer in the kitchen, mostly for playing music and looking up recipes. But I'd sit down at the breakfast bar pull up reruns of The Office, watch it in the morning as I was eating breakfast, and then go in for my day at work. And it really primed me to just be successful. Did you put anything in Jell-O at work? (laughs) I did not. (laughs) I did not. But my, 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 my favorite, uh, my, my favorite, I guess, prank on that caliber is, um, one of our graphic artists. She had stepped away for the, from the computer for a minute and I took a screenshot of her screen. Oh, I love this prank. Then I flipped it upside Upside down, down, made it full screen in Photoshop, disabled all the toolbars and she came back and was trying to click on things and was wondering why her, her computer was broken for about five good minutes there. Oh, Oh, that's awesome. I'm so impressed with you. It was incredible. So Angela from Uh The Office, I don't ask me what I was doing looking at random BuzzFeed articles, but everyone needs their outlet, right? We all do. Um, Angela at The Office, I guess, recently saw herself in her nephew's tinder photo oh and was totally roasting him for it because he was trying to play up on tinder that angela i don't remember her last name Mm -hmm. for real her real last name's like martin or something Mm -hmm. along those lines that that angela was was his aunt and um yeah she roasted him for it she should he deserved it good job so what is the next wine we have? All right. Thank you very much for keeping us on task here. <laughs> so we're, we're going to get 15 minutes. <laughs> yes. Without a sense of irony whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're going to dip into some 2016, uh, Pinot Noir from Archery Summit and, uh, and, and go into a, a younger Pinot before we go into some of the aged Pinots. And this is a wine that you brought. So thank you very much. <laughs> that has to go in the intro. If you didn't have to pee before, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Mm. Well, this Pinot Noir is beautiful. It's very dark. That yeah. smells good. So one of the big things that Oregon has in common with uh, with Burgundy that set them apart from most other Pinot Noir producing regions and a lot of other wine regions in the world is that their their higher latitudes and more marginal climates and uh so one vintage to the next has a huge impact on 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 the character of the wine as opposed to you know warmer areas like california where i came from um and you know no no hate going on love it miss it glad i'm here at the same time um warmer areas there's there's much more consistency one year to the next and so uh so so this is a 2016 pinot noir from the dundee hills and a lot of color and that's mm-hmm. you know not, not a lot of 16s have been released yet there's there's a couple out there but that's an inherent trait of um of this vintage from from every uh every oregon pinot i've seen thus far Really, really intense color, and 16 was a hot year. I have to say, my first thoughts on this wine was, oh, sweet baby Jesus, this is so good. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoy. I'm glad you enjoy. I know I've been, uh, was, was a little shy about, uh, about where I worked in the past, and, uh, legal, if you hear this, I'm, I'm a different Chris Lopez. <laughs> 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 um, but I, uh, I, I'm a manager at Archery Summit Winery up in, uh, up in Dundee. And, uh, and this is one of our, one of our brand new releases. This is a, a staff favorite as well as, uh, been a big hit in the tasting room. And unlike most of our wines, most of our single vineyards, um, are exclusive to the tasting room and the wine club. This one will see a little bit of distribution. So your, your listeners may be able to find it out there. This is a really good wine. I, I recommend this wine with barbecue. I recommend this wine with venison. 
I recommend this wine with lamb, red meats. Days that end in Y? All of those. <laughs> There's dark cherry, a little bit of cocoa nib, cracked black pepper. There's some toasted notes. It's a little bit smoky, and I like that. That's got a really good flavor. Now, this is a 2016. It tastes great as is, but is this going out for immediate release, or does it need to sit for a little while longer? It is going out for immediate release, and um, going into aging wines, I mean, there's a lot of folks that, especially up here in the Willamette Valley, that I've heard salespeople um, equating ageability of a wine to quality of a wine, and they're not exactly one and the same, especially with Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir, if if you're going to enjoy it, you shouldn't have to age it. Will right. will this improve over a little bit of time? Absolutely. Will this warrant um, aging? You know, absolutely. And actually, some of the uh, from from excellent producers in the Willamette Valley, some of the multi vineyard blends have actually been the wines that have mo- more consistently aged gracefully, um, by virtue of it being not just that one vineyard site. I feel like the wine has a bit of blueberry at the end. So going going into those flavors, and um, I, I think it it definitely makes sense to think about specific flavors. But I'm I'm going to try to be a little bit more general in our talk um, myself and talk, and especially with this because I'm absolutely biased. I love this wine, and I'll admit it. And mm-hmm. I um I love you this know, wine too. I, uh, I, I'm super biased, but. I've heard a lot of, um, so we were talking blueberry. Someone said a little hint of smoke. There were some other things in there, right? So we've got a lot of fruit. We've got a lot of, um, barrel aspects and we're seeing those primary and secondary flavors going on in here. This is a young wine. I mean, look at this. I don't think we, do we have some white paper? So, so, so take a look oh. at this. There's some color here. There's yeah. some like more mm-hmm. electric colors around the in or around the edges there as we tilt this over a white piece of paper and look at it. And um there's there's some very intense red raspberry magenta. leading toward kind of darker magenta colors going on in here. Very, very vibrant, very electric. Those vibrant colors that's uh anthocyanins it's a specific uh, family of compounds and those are some of the very first um very first things in the wine to degrade and and as we look at some of these other pinots and i haven't had a chance to look at i know we have a 2009 and uh a, a much older one back there a 94 it looks like um as we look at those you're going to notice in the glass straight off the bat, it's a completely different animal. Mm-hmm. Well, the color is reminiscent of cutting open a very ripe prickly pear. Mm-hmm. If you're from Ca- California or any desert region and you've had red prickly pear fruit, mm-hmm. that's so good. When you l- lay that over bl- uh, white paper, that's the color that I'm getting off of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I really enjoyed eating that when I lived in California. My neighbor had a really big prickly pear cactus. Yeah. If you're not from California and you're organ born and raised like I am, uh, looks like the pomegranate juice that you buy from the store. <laughs> hey, okay, pomegranate. I I'll give you that. that. I'll I give you that. that. Mm-hmm. Or uh, some really good Bing cherries. Phytochemicals uh, are a really important component in wine. They are anthocyanin is the phytochemical that's really linked to the anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, nutritious power of red wine. Uh, it's what you have in blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, any of your dark fruits are going to have a lot of those anthocyanins. So as a wine ages, the phytochemicals break down and it changes the color of the wine. We go from a pomegranate inside of a prickly pear cactus fruit color. It sounds delicious. Yeah, it does. Mm-hmm. Let's mix those two. And then it ages into more of a copper brown as the phytochemicals break down. Exactly. And it's it's not just those. It is um the the entire uh entire family of phenols within the wine. Um so tannins fall in that same family. There's a lot of other chemicals, uh technically chemical compounds there that are naturally occurring in the wine that fall in that family. 
and as it as it ages it's going to age in both an aerobic and an anaerobic, anaerobic um way because there's a little bit of oxygen that they say permeates the cork and there's little bit of oxygen that's introduced at other points in in the winemaking and um so essentially you know like like the birth of of the galaxy things coming together things bursting apart it kind of kind of goes on and on it's it's honestly something that science doesn't uh doesn't completely comprehend the aging of wine and for the longest time they thought that it was just these these chemicals these tannins that would would break down what what it's been discovered is is that it's these tannins that and, and sometimes they do break apart but a lot of times you know they're they're combining and through combining they they actually it reduces the total surface area of that that chemical chain and so you you experience it less because there's less surface area also those those um those compounds change and combine and become different compounds and at some point the chemical chains become long enough that they precipitate out of the wine i mean that really sounds a lot like what happens with a very hoppy beer if you let a hoppy beer sit in the hops i mean it's not exactly the same but but the hops because they're an oil they will gradually come together and form and will kind of settle out of the beer they'll and coalesce they'll coalesce and they they leave that flavor trail behind but as they combine there is less surface area and then as they start to fall away and and you know just turn into sediment then they're they're changing the flavor profile of that beer because because they're essentially removing themselves from that flavor profile. I'm glad it made sense to you, because honestly, I just made it up. <laughs> <laughs> it made great sense. <laughs> you sounded so smart. <laughs> so, I, As with everything I say, it makes sense if you don't think about it. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So... On that note, I, I think I think we need to jump a few years further back in history and dip into this 2009. So this is one of the wines from our pantry. It's a 2009 Trinity Vineyards Pinot Noir. And uh, I love this wine. Have you had this yet, Chris? I have not. This is the Winemaker's Reserve. And uh, I'm a big fan of this wine. Big fan of this wine. The first smells I get off this are oregano. It is a very herbal wine, yeah. and, and 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 to to put this in 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 perspective, this is the the 2009, 2016, both very very hot years in the grand scheme of things. Not that it's it's ever a direct correlation, especially across different producers, but similar within reason as far as if you if you were just to further age you know something a number of other years this this kind of gets us to a to a spot that we'd expect to be right now correct me if i'm wrong a hot year creates thicker skins in the grapes in theory yeah well in trinity is <laughs> a little bit different because it, when we went and talked to him he talked specifically about how where they're positioned on a hill in south salem they have a lot of wind that blows through there a ton of wind and the skins on his grapes, generally speaking, end up being thicker or, you know, that's what he's been told by several of his friends that are winemakers. That is what he said. That's what he said. <laughs> Just for you. I love it. Now, when we do the white paper test, there is more of a tawny, coppery, brick red color mm -hmm. coming through and less magenta, pomegranate, prickly pear cactus. Yeah. And it does have a little bit of that brown color you were talking about. This is you're you're right about the herb nose on this. I am getting a little dark plum though. So it's like dark plum, oregano. This really interesting thing happens when you start getting to older wines. It it seems counterintuitive, but as wines as wines age and get in toward their middle or later of their kind of expected lifespan, there's a point where the fruit comes out even more than when they're young. And so uh, a lot of people think of, you know, wine aging as like like a bell curve, you know. You you've got that peak and you're going to let it sit and you're going to try to find that peak. Um in actuality, it's it's more like a roller coaster, just like all of our own lives. And so you've got some high points, you've got some low points. This high point might be a little different than that high point even though they're both uh they're both right up there and uh you're 
every single point along that trajectory, you're going to be a different person, just like this is going to be a different wine. Mm hmm. Most wines produced, you know, they're they're really uh really designed to to be opened um, on release or shortly thereafter. In fact, I was reading some metrics uh, a little while back, and in the U.S., the average time that um that that people hold on to wine is is about two hours. So that's about the time that it takes to get back from the store and get it on your table. Yeah, yeah. we're an impatient people, and you know. I, that being said, I don't think that there's anything completely wrong with, you know, doing that as long as you know that that's what you're getting into. Um, the, uh, the Beaujolais that I brought at the beginning, it, I mean, generally Beaujolais, you want to drink them younger and they don't have as long, long of an aging curve as, as a lot of other, other varietals. And so, I mean, love it for what it is because it's great. Mm -hmm. You try to lay that mm -hmm. thing down for, you know, 15 years, I guarantee you, you're, you're up for disappointment. Right. Well, and then you have winemakers like Steve Parker at Trinity, where he'll sit on his wines until he feels like they are as good as they're going to get. And then he releases them, whether that's two years or 10 years, he just leaves that kind of up to the wine to figure out when it wants to be released. I mean, he's, he's big into that. He always releases his wines when they're ready to be drank, not when they're ready to be aged, but it's not always the year he makes them. It could be 5, 10, 15 years down the road. And I think there's a beauty to that. It's all different perspectives. One one thing that I really enjoy is, in general, I've, I've learned that I really like younger to middle-aged wines. <laughs> 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 and, and, you know, I absolutely love and appreciate older wines, but... A lot of the times it's, it's not what the day calls for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a beauty also to being able to follow that wine along in its life. The single thing that I did on my own accord that I it was just mind shattering, more mind shattering than just about anything else that I've done unilaterally in wine is I bought a, uh, I, I bought a, um, six pack of Barbera from this little winery in Paso Robles called Kumea and followed that. I opened a bottle, not exactly, but roughly every six months and it changes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, it changed my whole outlook on 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 how and and whatever I did with uh, with older wines. So, wow, I think that's I good. I want to do that. Yeah, and well, this wine wasn't expensive. Find something you like, especially a varietal that's going to age a little bit more quickly, like um, like Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. Pinot. Um, I'm pretty biased, but like Pinot Noir, it's it's got a pretty pretty quick aging curve there, and you'll see it go through a lot of different phases. Over um, over three years. So if you were going to age a wine, you'd choose one that had a higher acid and higher tannin content. So you'd have a longer sustained aging process. Yeah. And also choose one that you like, um, because just like you don't expect people to completely change, marriage doesn't change people. Um, Never. You know, you're not expecting that wine to completely, completely become something it's not. So choose something you like and choose something with uh, with with a good uh, a good concentration of flavor and good. something that's well made. That's Go to a, town. That's a really great experiment to do. I can see why you would do it given your profession, but I think that would be a really fun thing for just about anyone to mm -hmm. do if they're a, a wine enthusiast. You know, do that experiment. What is it going to hurt? I did that when I was not a wine professional, when I was strictly a wine enthusiast. Really? Yep. You know, if we bought a case of something we really like and then just every six months opened a bottle, see yeah. how it goes over the course of three or four years. We should buy a 12-pack because six of those are going to get drank right up front. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll be kind of sick of it and I'll be able to to let those other ones sit, you know. That's you know, awesome. there's something to be said about a self-aware man. <laughs> so true. Even John Wayne said a man should know his own limitations. Just saying. I love that you pulled out the John Wayne quote, by if the way. John Wayne was a wine. I think John Wayne would would be a wine like this. A oh. lot of interest. Mm -hmm. It's it's got some savory components. It's uh, it's it's a little hot mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's it's at the same time not shy. 
I want to dive into this wine and 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 talk about it with you guys a little bit okay. because there's a lot going on here. It is. It's a very complex profile. I love the herb with it. I mm-hmm. really want to have a bowl of spaghetti with this wine. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. I'm yeah, with it's you. Big enough to stand up to it. This is big enough to stand up to something like a buffalo steak that's been cooked over a very hot fire. A little fire and char is not going to back this wine down. I feel like it's got enough of that structure, enough of that backbone to to put up with some really big flavors and food. And correct me if I'm wrong. Buffalo is a slightly leaner red meat. Yes. It yeah. Is. Okay. It is. Yeah. I thought so. And you're absolutely right. Not a lot of tannins going on in this, and uh, you want you want to pair those fats with wines that have more more tannic structure because those fat compounds and the tannin molecules really um, come together and and do something beautiful. Right, you'd have you don't this, have that. You'd have this with a venison, buffalo, emu. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> she just pulled the emu out. <laughs> oh my gosh! I um. I used to get emus and uh, what's that other animal? Ostrich. No, not an ostrich. Uh, so the the emus, that's a bird, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I used to get, I'm second guessing myself here. I used to get emus and not llamas, but that other thing that's alpaca? like llama. L- not that one. There's another one. Maybe it's an alpaca. I used to get him confused. Don't ask me. What how. did you get these animals for? I didn't actually have them just in talking about them. It oh. like, like you say the word emu mm-hmm. and it seems like it should be a long necked hairy beast, not a bird. It is a long necked bird though. Yes, but it's, it's got, it, it's a hair thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We've gone way off base here. Alpacas. <laughs> That's going to be the name of your autobiography, by the way. A Mine? long-necked hairy beast? No, emus and alpacas. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering what you were pulling out of that mm-hmm. to name the autobiography. Well, the thing about autobiographies is that they need a colon and then something after that, right? Powell. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, so uh, alpacas, llamas, camels, they're all in the same family. So they're all long-necked Emus beasts. could be in there, too. No, it's a bird and a mammal. You don't know. I do know. (laughs) I do know. I have two biology degrees. You're all wrong. I had a llama once. (laughs) Ooh, Andy's been nuzzled by two llamas at the same time. I have. Not many men can say that. I know. (laughs) I'm telling you, man. Emus and alpacas. (laughs) One man's journey on the road to wine. (laughs) None of that makes sense. That's the point. I like it, though. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's got a ring catchy. to it. So llamas are some of my favorite animals, and they are in the camelid family. And uh, I know a lady that has a llama farm in the Crevallis area. And so we went out to visit, and I, I was just in my element having a good time. They had a massive crutch on Andy. The llamas loved Andy. I think Can it's the facial him? hair. No, he's a hottie. <laughs> So two of the girls just, they just wanted to be all up in Andy's business and they nuzzled him and they were fighting over him. So he has been nuzzled by two llamas at the same time. I'll tell you what, man, it's a trip watching those things come running up to you like full gallop. They're running towards you and you just have to stand your ground because if you try to run away, they, of course, are a lot faster and they'll just they'll kick you. They they kick hard. It'll it'll hurt you. It'll break a leg, and you just have to stand there and stand your ground. And so I'm standing there, and this thing is coming full charge at me, and I'm just thinking, well, hope I've got good insurance, you know. <laughs> and uh, this llama is just full gallop, and then puts the brakes on right before it gets to me, and literally slides into my face and touches my nose just ever so gently. It it was just like the perfect time for that llama to hit the brakes and just slide right up into my grill. And she's sniffing my face and and right up against it. Uh, You guys don't understand. She kissed you. It sounds like I'm exaggerating, (laughs) but I'm not exaggerating. It was it was like she went from 25 miles an hour to a stop right just barely resting against my nose. And she sniffed around, and I'm thinking, okay, am I going to get an eyeball bit out? And, Sounds uh, beautiful. Mm-hmm. It was really cool to watch. It, I was trying to do the like the alpha thing, where if you've got a really aggressive dog, you need to 
project an alpha. You can't just say, hey, I'm the alpha. Like, you have to project it out of yourself, you know? So I was really trying to do that so that she wouldn't mess me up and uh, or kick me, you know, in the shins and break my leg. And then she just started nuzzling me. So people think all llamas spit. They don't. They they do that as a defense mechanism. And if they find that you're a safe person and you're the pheromones that you exude and your body posture exudes confidence and safety, Mm -hmm. then they're very sweet and nuzzling and they have beautiful eyes and long eyelashes and they think my husband's cute. So, and also let's not forget besides uh, spitting for defense, they also kick you so hard that it breaks (laughs) shin bones. Um, (laughs) anyways, so this wine, (laughs) Hey, some people spit for defense too. (laughs) The wine is great. There's an intense concentration of flavors here, and uh, it's it, it's not shy at all. Are you getting some of those uh, some of those tertiary flavors that I was talking about a little bit? So things that aren't aren't directly derived from um, from the fruit or from the the barrel or the winemaking process. I mean, we've we've got a lot more herbal flavors going mm-hmm. on in there that you don't normally see. I mean, smell it. Are, are you getting a little bit of leather going on? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> Walking into bit a of, saddle shop, right? Saddle shop. Little bit of um of of ethyl acetate. That's kind of that that fingernail polish. And I uh, we got into a big debate about this at work the other day. Hmm. I like a little bit of that in wine. And mm. through tasting panels, it's actually been demonstrated rather recently that a little bit of ethyl acetate is something that people's palates tend to prefer in wine. Oh. And historically, it was considered a a fault. Um, any, any noticeable ethyl acetate in wine was considered a, a fault, but that's one of the, one of the ways that people's palates and the science and the art of it all progresses. And so just, just a little bit of it, and I'm getting a little bit of it here. And it, um, it actually directly enhances your perception of some of the fruit flavors and all w- without just making it over the top fruity, but adding in a little element of balance there. And, and I'm definitely getting that here and really freaking loving it Mm -hmm. i i get a lot of oregano herbal notes on the smell and then i get like a bright tomato at the back this is just something i really want to have with italian food i think would hold up really well for that i I agree with you there's a lot of complex flavors you aren't just getting cherry blueberry stone fruit Mm -hmm. while you're sniffing that wine and sniff and think about it but i'm gonna call you out there as far as being a badass by talking about stone fruit in a red wine a lot of people think like, you know, all that orchard fruit that can kind of, you know, aside from maybe cherries that can kind of stay in the white wine territory. No, I would and, disagree. And, you know, all the red fruits, those guys can just kind of stay over in, in, in the, um, in the red wine territory. And I'll tell you, hands down, you know, I've gotten, I've gotten kisses of strawberry mm-hmm. off the of white wines mm-hmm. and I've gotten like, some peach and apricot mm-hmm. and tropical fruits off of red wines. And Absolutely. so don't pigeonhole yourselves. Desegregate. I'd say besides the herbal notes and a tomato, I would say there's a dried cherry going on. And that shift to dried fruit flavors mm-hmm. is is another thing that, mm-hmm. that fruit character starts to get um starts to to get more of kind of a dried aspect. As wines age. Yeah, I I think in the earlier wines, I tasted the fresh fruit flavors, Uh, fresh stone fruits, fresh blueberries, a little bit of fresh currant. And then but the acid that comes off of those, that's that's really what I got was when you bind into those fruits and you first get that really tart flavor off of the skin that seemed like it was really prominent in those earlier wines. But this it's a lot more subtle. And part of that's going to be, uh, going to be the vintage. Acid is a compound in a wine that once the wine is bottled, as long as there's not the, uh, um, the, the microbes that will actually turn it into vinegar, acid is a, um, a fixed point in a wine. So mm-hmm. you, your perception of that acid will change as the wine ages, but it's never going to be objectively more or less acidic than it was at the time it was bottled. Right. 
and and most of what uh, what we taste is actually smell mm -hmm. and smell our our smell memory our scent memory is very experiential it's the limbic system the olfactory uh -huh. nerves do connect directly to the limbic system in the brain, which is your memory center of the brain. So that's why smell is such a direct connection to memory. And that's why if if I'm talking about one thing, I know for a fact that a lot of people that I meet aren't going to have that same same base of experience mm -hmm. that that I do with those kind of fall leaves Um and so, to to be honest, unless I'm really getting it, I, I don't talk about that in wine a lot of times. And I'm going to say, I, I think that it, I think the more we talk about these things, the more that a um, common, uh, common lexicon will develop. Mm -hmm. And I think that those types of tasting notes are one of the things that holds people back from... Um, talking about wine being being brave about wine mm. and uh and you know experiencing wine with others in a uh in in a um discussion and kind of a interchange kind of sense and um i i really think that some of the most interesting most evocative best things that i've heard about wines have been from novice wine drinkers that for whatever reason on that day were, were brave enough to just blurt it out and it just uh the way you experience it is going to be different than the way andy experiences <laughs> it is going to be different the way that i experience mm -hmm. it and um being able to 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 talk with that with each other i mean it's it's a freaking journey we get mm -hmm. to take together mm -hmm. right well so. i feel like you're touching on something that's a little bit larger even <laughs> because you're you went to school in uh new hampshire vermont the, vermont same thing i thought you said new hampshire sorry vermont to massachusetts okay the the climate is going to be very similar to what we have here for the most part i'm pretty sure yeah i mean more snow there but uh the, colder more humid right right but but very green when you do spend time outdoors for the most part it's going to be in a jacket walking through a forest or something like that Oregon is a very similar experience i think the larger thing that you're touching on here is that a lot of these tasting notes the things that we're saying and the things we're talking about with these wines they are things that a person would really only know if they were able to travel to these areas and experience these particular things. Because if a person was born and raised in Arizona, never went anywhere else, and even, let's limit ourselves, stayed within a 100-mile radius their entire lives. I know that sounds bizarre to us because we're all people that have traveled around, but I've known lots of people that were that way. Born, lived, died in a 150-mile radius you know and it's one thing to do that in oregon because 150 mile radius mm -hmm. from where you are you could be the ocean or you could be in the desert and anything in between but when you have someone that lives in like the southwest let's say it's not that way they're they're going to have a very specific climate that they live in and experience through the midwest you see a lot of that uh so oregon lends a lot not just to our lives and experience but also our palate that's a lot to think about. And I think you brought it home really, uh, really, really well, well there. I, I think in that same way though, it's w without getting too kind of, kind of granola, earthy, crunchy here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's not just, not, not just where you live because where you live will open you to, open you to, um, a lot of possibilities, of course. But hell, globalization, you can say all the bad stuff you want about it. And there's there's a lot of bad stuff to say. But there's someone in Phoenix can walk into their grocery store and grab fresh tropical fruits off of the off of the aisle, give it a big sniff, you know, throw it in the cart, taste it that night and and experience something that someone a 100 years ago living in that same spot would have been impossible for them to. Right. So it's, it's not, it's not just the opportunity. It's being awake for that opportunity. If, if, if I can go there, like, I mean, you know, don't just, don't just like go somewhere and be somewhere, like experience stuff. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, I went on, 
on a tour of um Tablas Creek down in uh down in Paso Robles. And this is if if you uh you you haven't um experienced Tablas Creek, one of my favorite wineries in in California. Absolutely fabulous work. Um mostly Rhone varietals in the northwestern kind of section of Paso. Amazing. And they're 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 also situated on top of this uh this limestone deposit, yeah. which gives gives the wines a pretty unique character. Going on this uh on this vineyard and winery tour, they had just cut into um into a section of the side of the mountain where they were building uh building their new tasting room. And um I'm uh, walking over there and they literally just kind of cut through there what was it, a month before? And so um I I grab this chunk of limestone and uh, I, I say to the guy, you know, oh, yeah, can can I can I have this? And he's like, oh, yeah, of course. Sure. And I said, oh, awesome. First thing I did is I gave licked a good it. look and then I licked it. Mm-hmm. And um, we were I should have known better because we were in a group mixed group. There were like, you know, a dozen people kind of with uh, with us on this tour here. And uh, people I didn't know and um, people were just looking at me like I just sprouted a second head. Probably not the most sanitary thing I've done in my life, but I'm OK with that. There's there's something different that happens. And and I'm going to say and maybe you can correct me here, doctor. Um, but I, I'm going to say that from from the last time I had researched this. We didn't completely understand exactly how smell and taste tie together because when you have something in your mouth, even though technically most of what you're experiencing is smell, experientially it's very, very different than when you're smelling that thing. And so there's something different when you have something tactilely in your mouth as far as how you how you um receive those sensory perceptions and when you're just smelling it, even though a lot of it's technically still smell. So licking that limestone it, it's it sounds crazy. It probably is crazy, but go do it. Go I lick some done limestone. The same thing. Lick some granite, lick some quartz, lick some slate. Whatever you want to lick, I support it. I got to say, Chris and Caitlin from Vivacity Spirits here in Corvallis, they had some very similar things that they talked about, and their filter media for their their uh, base liquor, which, of course, is a corn base, their distillate, but their filter media is activated charcoal because that's what you use, but also lava, rock, and limestone. Ah, I didn't know that about them. Yes, sir. And so you picking that rock up and licking it to kind of experience what it is that's happening in that soil. It's something very similar to what they did trying to figure out how they were going to add flavor to their distillate, even though they were filtering things out. Right. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here eating some of these beautiful figs that my wife picked off of her fig bush and cut into slices and we're we're eating it with this wine it, it pairs fantastic with this wine it's a brown turkey fig for our listeners out there it's not a green fig it's not a deep purple fig it's a brown turkey fig it looks like the on the outside when it's ripe the brown skin of a turkey you pull out of the oven and they are absolutely tastes delightful. like honey mm-hmm. they're insanely good pairs really well with this wine and so shout out kudos to uh, Steve Parker at Trinity for making a really fantastic mm-hmm. wine. Yes. Thank you, Steve. This this was a treat. Well, we got one more treat one more. for you before you go. So this <laughs> this wine is a beauty is made by Jerry Sass Jr. It was made in 1994 and the label on it says Wild Winds. But uh, you can find them at Sass Winery these days. Let me go ahead and pour for you, my friend. And Jerry Sass Jr., I mean, with a name like that, you're either going to, you know, going to sing soul or you're going to make wine. The thing I tend to hear about Jerry whenever I talk to other winemakers is what a nice guy he is and how he'll just bend over backwards for anybody. So I met him um, through you guys. Mm -hmm. Uh, You you hosted a a gathering out at Sass. Mm -hmm. And gosh, what a perfect day. Mm -hmm. It was in October last year. Year before last? Year before last. Year before. Yeah. It's been that long. Wow, we have to do that again. So, just had the first sip of this, and what a different animal. With older wines, and I'm going to quote uh, quote Michael Broadbent, a very, very famous um, British wine importer. 
he he said that with older wines, you know, there are no great, great wines, no great vintages, only great bottles. And I got to tell you, we've got a great bottle here going back to 94, where uh, where we're over 20 years old now on this wine, 24 year old wine. And this thing is just singing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like you said, wines, they don't just go up and up and up or down and down and down they they go up they go down they go up and they go down when we got this bottle it was not too long ago a few months ago and jerry the third actually popped a bottle open and he tried it and he was just like oh i don't know what's going on with this wine but it's fantastic right now it's drinking really well right now and uh, we went ahead and picked up a bottle and actually i picked up the bottle thinking in the back of my mind this would be fantastic for chris's birthday we blew right past your birthday buddy so happy belated okay <laughs> oh my gosh that's very kind of you this is this is quite a treat and this is a beautiful wine one of the things that i do in in my day job is i oversee our our library we have a very deep library of wines at work um going back to the earliest days of the winery um 93 in that case and not that I'm making the final calls on these things. Um, it's, you know, jointly with, with the winemaker and the director and their, their voices are louder in this as they should be. Um, but I, I get the opportunity to taste, um, much more than my fair share of beautifully aged old Oregon Pinot Noir and, uh, m mature Oregon Pinot Noir. And, and I got to tell you, this is this is some sexy stuff. <laughs> the story behind this wine, we were at a wine tasting at Sass Winery and they had moved Jerry Sass Sr.'s wine collection into the winery. Yes, yes. For storage right. because he had moved from a very large house to a much smaller space. And so of course there wasn't there wasn't room for his vast wine collection. And Somebody else there, another wine club member, had said, hey, what do you have in the back? What do you have on the top of that pile? And normally that's your job. Normally that's my job. <laughs> I go into a winery and I do that. Be like, what do you have in the back? What are you keeping from me? Hmm. What are you storing for yourself? Because there's always something. There's always there's something. There's always something. And there's always in the, are you sure that what's written on that box is what's actually in that box? <laughs> the dustier the box, the further back in the pile it goes, the less accurate those labels are written in Sharpie as to what is in the box. Have and, you ever watched American Picker? She's like those guys. Yeah. <laughs> but for why? But for, but for why? This is, this is a unique trait. So uh, the other gentleman also, I think, has this trait. And he said, let's see what you got. And he was going to put his money where his mouth was. And so Jerry got on a ladder mm -hmm. and climbed up and started opening up boxes and pulling out bottles and handing them down. And, and I'll tell you what, man, Lord bless him. He found a, a box of this 94. They, you know, picked out what they wanted to save. Mm -hmm. And then we were talking about buying some. And then he said, you know, I don't feel right selling it. I, I have no idea what's in these mm -hmm. bottles. Let's pop one open and mm -hmm. try it. And uh, it was every bit as good as what you're tasting here. There was a couple other bottles that were a little bit younger, mm -hmm. you know, late 90s, early 2000s that also were purchased. And we've also got a 97 in there. Yeah. I'm going to save that for a little while. And so this they we all tasted it. And Andy just looked at me and said, uh huh. We are buying this. We are uh -huh. taking this home. So it was a really fun time. You know, do that also at uh, small batch breweries. If they bottle. You know, it, it's harder to say yeah. to them, hey, what do you have in the back when they've got, you know, 20 taps lined up? But, yeah, if it's a brewery that's doing their own bottle stuff, oh, yeah. Yeah, you you see what they have. I will say shout out to our East Coast listeners. Schmaltz Brewery is closing next month and moving to a new location. So if you want to get some unique stuff that I know they have in the back because we got some of their unique creations I, I would say go to schmaltz mm -hmm. and get some fun kosher beers that will blow your mind i'm sad to see them closing down i'm really hoping that they'll be able to keep doing what they do best though yeah they're moving to a different location bigger space to do other bigger and brighter things i hope that their small batch creativity continues exactly exactly this we wine is amazing i i feel that this wine continues on some of those palette 
profiles we talked about with the leather. So on this one, I'm going to say I I am getting that leather. I'm getting it less than the other. I would agree. I'm seeing more um uh, more to tobacco notes mm-hmm. specifically like if we're talking about like I'm going to get weird. We're all going to get weird at some point here or we're <laughs> we're all essentially weird already at yes. just letting it out. Cigars uh-huh. with and I'm talking like not one of these little little mini swisher Mm-mm. sweets. I'm talking about like a big old fat Churchill. The one behind um, your right shoulder. Exactly. <laughs> But like with with like a super dark wrapper, yeah, right, and um and uh, so 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 that kind of uh kind of you know sweet muskiness that that comes with that, mm-hmm. and um absolutely the the um the the fall leaves and and there's something there's something else though underneath it there's like a mushroom component or yes. bark uh, yeah like like this organic earth component right there's like an oak bark dust like you know when you put bark dust fresh down into your garden beds mm-hmm. for those mm-hmm. of you that garden i love mm-hmm. to garden i i definitely need my dirt therapy that's very important so this this has a lot of earthy mineral qualities bark leaves leather tobacco there's a dried fruit component i'm not getting Current and the fruit's definitely taking a back seat. It is I taking mean, a back seat. It doesn't. It doesn't taste like it's you know, like like it's not. Gosh, it doesn't taste like there's no fruit in it. But there's not a lot of very distinguishable fruit. Yet still, it seems it seems lively. It doesn't seem mm-hmm. flat. It doesn't seem tired. It's like it's, a- it's definitely mature. But it's like your your wiry old grandfather that still 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 walks ten miles and mm-hmm. swims laps every day. It's a fruit leather, not a fresh like fruit. your wily mm-hmm. old grandfather. Yes. <laughs> I I would say there's a there's a candied component to it. I I have trouble. I don't want to tell people that it's a sweet wine because people no. definitely think about sweet and they go, oh yeah, I know what a sweet wine is. So that's not what I mean when I say sweet. Sweet but tobacco a, smoke. Yeah, there's a sweetness to this that's very nice. I'm gonna pick up on a word that you just threw down there. The the candied component. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. Now you definitely can get a lot of that candied fruit from um, from young wines, but wines that were built in in a style that enable aging. Once they have aged, and a lot of times that fruit, when it's young in its youth, will be very much fresh fruit and mm-hmm. you know and concentrated or what have you but as it ages it goes through you know periods of where you're looking at and feeling more dried fruit sometimes it'll feel more um more candied fruit mm-hmm. um you know and 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 that that in itself right there in this sense is and when we're talking candied fruit we're not talking about like cherry jolly mm-hmm. rancher mm-hmm. um but there it, it feels like it has this kind of mm-hmm. uh, darker candied kind of aspect to and, it, right? And that's that's exactly, that's a great point, and that's exactly what I'm saying. It's not sugar as, as much as it is dark brown sugar. It's not as much candy as it is like a, like a dark caramel. There, there's Preserved. a caramel... Yeah, there's a there's a caramely vanilla aspect to this. I, I I just there's something there that I can't quite put my finger on. But uh, if you've ever had like maple candy, mm-hmm. there's a little bit of that going on. I I have to say I ha- there I feel like we've worked our way through the seasons. 2016 might have been your spring, your fresh bright fruits, your fresh blueberries. We hit 2009, and that was a summer into fall. And 94, we're finishing with your winter. And mm-hmm. you think of like your, the dried fruits that you use in your winter and fall desserts and the meals that you serve in the winter, they're going to have that preserved, dried, sugared, concentrated, aged component. So I feel like we've, we've worked our way through the seasons and ending in winter. Mm-hmm. Win- winter in Oregon for sure. Winter in Oregon. Yep. So speaking very generally here, um, I have been incredibly impressed with a lot of the mid and late 90s Pinot Noir mm. that I've tasted from Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as the bottles aren't corked mm-hmm. and as long as, you know, of course, things are sound. But I've been very impressed. 
not every vintage is as good is 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 as mm-hmm. good as that. Not every mm-hmm. vintage warrants, you know, twenty four uh, twenty four years worth of aging. Mm-hmm. The two thousand nine, in general, I don't think is going to go this long, and right. not right. not about that specific wine, but that vintage as a whole, mm-hmm. and that wine. Much more alive than, than, uh, and, and much more, um, vibrant. The point isn't for old wines or mature wines to taste youthful. Mm-hmm. That's, that's not really the goal. You don't age them so you can say, oh, this 30 year old wine tastes like it's so young. Like that, that's not the point, but you want them to be vibrant still. Mm-hmm. And that definitely was, but there are a number of wines from other producers here in the Willamette Valley. Um, in 2009 that they've got one foot in the grave Mm -hmm. already. Right. Right. It it was a hot year. It was a tough year. Generally here in, in, in Oregon, the, the very hot years don't age as gracefully. This one definitely Mm -hmm. impressed me. This 94 is just off the hook. I got to tell you, I, um, when, when I came here today, I almost brought a couple older wines in my cellar. And um, we'll, we'll definitely do that again in the future. But I, uh, I came, I saw some of the lineup, and I'm like, maybe I should have just because, you know, with these old bottles, you never know. And one could be kind of funky or over the hill. This has been this has been a stunning lineup today. We've done really Absolutely nice. stunning lineup today. Go team. Can I just say cheers to that? Cheers. And on that note, I do believe that it's time to end. You guys, thank you so much for being here and doing this. Chris, thank you so much. Corianne, thank you so much. I've been wanting to get Corianne in the studio to do this because her palate is just off the hook. I mean, it's it mine pales in comparison to hers. Biologically, women have superior palates to men, generally speaking. Well, and then you mix in a Mensa level IQ and a photographic palette, and uh, you end up with this one over here. So I'm over here saying things like, yeah, it tastes like a composted potato. Uh, <laughs> You're cutting of, that out. Spe- speaking of those composted potatoes, um, I see a bottle of rum over there oh. with the Vivacity label on it. We're going to dip into that yes. after the show. Yes. Yeah, we are. Now that we're done with the wine. Pretty excited. Yes. So thank you, you guys. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. Of course, uh, you know, hit us up, boostboostbbq.com, which is where you can find the podcast. We've got lots of other stuff coming up. Make sure to go and check out the shirts, teespring.com slash boostboostbbq. All of the good stuff. Corianne's getting her own social media up and going. Chris, although he takes some fantastic photos, he's stingy and keeps them to himself. And we're okay with that. I, I do have a couple shout outs though. I'm going to shout out to wine in general. If you've got that bottle, you've been sitting on it, go pop that cork. Mm-hmm. It wants to hang out with you. It wants you to spend some quality time with it. Go pop that cork. Um, also want to shout out to, um, to, to another podcast I've been listening to a lot lately that has some crossovers. We've got wine and crime, some wonderful ladies out of Minnesota. They're, they're hilarious. They're not nearly as good looking as, uh, as Corianne here and they cannot belch like Andy here, but. Oh, don't let them hear that. Uh, th- they'll be jealous about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but. Definitely need to try to get them on the show. I'm, I'm sensing a little crossover. I think there's a lot of crossover, mm-hmm. but don't, yeah. don't miss the wine guy. <laughs> Chris, the wine guy. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. It's always a treat. Yeah, thank you. Always my a friend. pleasure. Thank One you of for our having me. Very close, bestest friends. And fortunately, he is the wine guy. So we're we're very lucky. So you guys, thank you so much for Corey Ann and Chris. This is Andy, and we will see you next time. Boost, booze and barbecue.